So, as I said, one of the things I wanted to do for the symposium was to have a couple of panel sessions where some of my former students, and I should say that Doug Terry was not my student, but I wish he had been my student, um, would have been very proud of him being my student. Uh, so uh, just uh, to have an opportunity to, to sort of explore some life experiences and some sort of feedback and some uh, advice giving to uh, sort of current students who might be in the audience here today. So the um, topic of this panel is the future of graduate education and the context is the shifting employment patterns of PhDs in computer science. So uh, certainly when I started my career in the early 1980s, a majority of students who would come out of a program like Berkeley would become professors of computer science or go and work to the prestigious uh, research laboratories like Xerox PARC or, or IBM Research or Bell Labs or something like that. But over time, things have shifted, and we'll introduce the panelists in a second, but uh, several of them work in industrial environments in advanced development kinds of roles. Others are in sort of this new generation of industrial laboratory, which is held to a much more sort of uh, assessment of practical impact criterion in the sort of research that's done. Um, s some are uh, still university professors, but maybe we'll bring a perspective of how computer science uh, sort of graduate education and the opportunities for computer science graduates are changing in, in other parts of the world. So again, similar to the other panel, why don't we just start with uh, the panelists introducing themselves, talking about kind of uh, when roughly they graduated from Berkeley, but then, you know, briefly kind of what their current role is, particularly from the perspective of the panel, which is, you know, in what way do they interact with recent people who have graduated with advanced degrees in computer science? So we'll start with Wei Dong. All right. My name is Wei Dong. I'm PhD number 33. I graduated uh, in 2006. Uh, after that, I joined uh, Maxwell Research in Redmond. And I have been there since then, and uh, nine years and counting. And uh, at uh, MSR, I work on system software security. So when I start with uh, Randy, I work on networking. But uh, over my PhD, I migrate to, towards uh, security. Then when I join Microsoft, I say I want to run, since I'm running on the computer, I should look at the program. I have more information. And I start looking at Windows kernel, looking at the program. Now I'm doing software and the system security and the re reliability. Uh, Mario Silva, so I graduated in 1994. I am number nine. And um, um, uh, currently I'm at the University of Lisbon, Portugal, with uh, an assignment at a, a private nonprofit research institute um, doing research 50% of the time, and uh, where I, I have a group of about uh, 30 PhDs, uh, basically on information systems. Um, and um, algorithms. Uh, my, my topic was um, VLSI, uh, computer aided design for, for VLSI. Um, but after I finished my PhD, I kind of worked for some time in the, in the Silicon Valley in a connection with uh, Stanford. And after, you know, by then, I kind of found that my, my, my idea, my mission, what I wanted to do was, uh, in fact, um, uh, going back to university and, and teaching my country, so that's basically my main activity since then. Um, so that's, that's basically it. I'm Ari, uh, number 40. Uh, I graduated in 2012, spent two years working as a postdoc at Princeton, and now I am at Cloudera, where I work in the support group trying to automate the diagnosis and debugging pro uh, process for big data systems that fail. Oh, I'm Chika Che, I'm number six, and I graduated <laughs> in 92, and I started as a professor in Stony Brook, started in 93, then I stayed there for about 15 years. And at the time I was uh, working on software security, I thought I was doing a pretty good job, so I went to give a talk in Symantec, and then I'm hoping that they can adopt my technology, this and that, and they say, your job is okay, you know, but you know, it's still not very practical. And if you don't believe us, why don't you work for us for a period of time? At that time, then I 
I, I have a sort of like a, you know, sabbatical leave I'm coming up, so I say, fine, then I'll go there. And started like about two and a half years working there. And at the end of the, you know, the tenure, then the director asked me, and then what do you think? Then I say, I agree with you. My stuff is not practical now. <laughs> so then I went back to Stonybrook. But the, the experience of that just made me completely not interested in security anymore. <laughs> because it's just like <laughs> all the stuff that I did is just, just not very interesting after these two and a half years of experience. It's just like there are too many constraints when you build product. Like you have to be stable. You cannot use all these really weird techniques and you know, crash people's system, this and that. So I thought that's like a pretty good experience. But then after that, I went back to Stony Brook, teach for a semester, and then somebody from Taiwan called and said they have a position for me doing cloud computing, then I decided to go back. Now I went back to Taiwan for about six years, doing something related to cloud computing. I'm managing now a, a, a information and communication lab in a, a, this institute called Industrial Technology Research Institute, which is the sort of like a national lab in Taiwan, but whose charter, charter is really to support domestic uh, industry in Taiwan. So that's what I do now. Hey, I'm Yan Pei, uh, PhD 2012. I think I'm number 42 plus minus one. Randy hasn't updated his uh, list of students <laughs> in a while. So I don't know what is my precise number. I, uh, there were four of us that year. Ari is definitely number 40. Uh, and um, I'm not sure which of the other I am. So I'm 42 plus minus one. Anyway, um, I was. What's very clear from all of this is whatever's on the web is the fact, right? <laughs> yes. Exactly. The fact that I have a totally up to date CV on my computer means nothing. Because <laughs> I haven't updated the thing on the web. Go ahead. Yeah, you, you need to update it on your totally pimped out Facebook page. And you know, <laughs> yes. Whatever the interweb says is the, the recorded fact, <laughs> yes. Um, anyhow, these days I'm at Cloudera working on the performance engineering team. So I touch uh, all of our, um, the technologies in our platform portfolio. So that is SQL and Hadoop, uh, MapReduce itself, of course, free text search, HBase, and of course, Spark, which is a uh, very important and increasingly uh, vibrant part of our platform. So in, a, in, in one sentence, my job is to make things go fast and make all of that, the platform go fast. Um, as far as interaction with academia goes, um, Cloudera is fortunate to have uh, half of the Fortune 100 be our customers. And we are fortunate to have a very disciplined support organization of which Ari is a member. Uh, where we are able to see insights in terms of workloads, data, use cases from those customers. And based on the PhD work that me and my four peers of that year did under Randy, we know one thing that big data, the nature of the systems itself is complicated, it's rapidly moving, it's, uh, it's, it's highly scalable, it's mutually independent, there are so many design challenges that one needs to be selective and work on the real problems instead of the problems that we imagine, because there are just way too many problems that we can imagine. So uh, we have those uh, workload traces and data and so on and so forth, and actually I interact with a number of uh, different academia organizations, uh, both ac mostly across the US but also internationally, to um, share those traces and basically get uh, academia to work on problems that have immediate and real world impact. So in a nutshell, that's what I do. Make things go fast and help all of the academia community make things go fast. Doug? Uh, hi, my name is Doug Terry. Uh, I'm here as a plus one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I do have a PhD from Berkeley, uh, 1985, which makes me the old timer. I worked on Berkeley Unix, which probably none of you remember. Um, I, uh, last uh, fall, I had the forced opportunity to go out and find a new job. Um, <laughs> and so uh, since January, I've been at Samsung Research America, where I'm starting a new research lab in computer science and software systems. Uh, so I'm in the process of hiring a bunch of PhDs, or you know, extent that I can. 
Um, I've, I haven't had the good fortune of hiring anyone from Berkeley yet. I do have people from MIT and CMU and stuff, so I guess I'm starting at the second level schools. <laughs> 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 You know, our focus is to, is to bring software systems expertise to Samsung, which is primarily a hardware company, but realizes they need software to, to run on their hardware. Um, and the, uh, and the, our focus right now, uh, the important area for Samsung is on IoT and, and building software platforms for tying together a bunch of devices. Yeah, that's so pretty diverse set of panelists. Uh, people working in industrial research, managing industrial researchers, recent graduates who are doing industrial development and sort of an academic perspective from Europe where uh, there's a lot of discussion about how to recreate or sort of move education forward to be relevant while also cutting edge. Uh, so with that, I kind of like uh, have a few questions. One of the questions is what, if anything, in your graduate education was prepared you for the kind of work that you're currently doing for those of you who are not doing, let's say, traditional industrial research or academic research. So management, working in an environment with, which is a national resource uh, for competitiveness of Taiwanese industry, uh, you know, having some level of, of sort of developing uh, new innovative technologies for one of the world's leading technology companies, working. You know, what is it in your graduate education, some it's more distant in the past than others, uh, that was, you know, sort of most relevant for the things that you're doing today? Uh, I'd like to take a crack at this one. Uh, so I, I wrote a dissertation on automated debugging for big data clusters. Uh, when I went to Cloudera, this was either part of the reason why they wanted me. Uh, about three days after showing up, it became clear that the techniques I had developed were, of course, useless in practice. <laughs> but the evaluation techniques were useful, and the sort of writing techniques and the sort of data analysis techniques, and you know, how do you convince people that you have built a thing that works? That all transfers over. Right? That sort of learning how to sort of evaluate, how to document, how to demonstrate stuff, that really carries over quite naturally from a PhD program to industry. Right? That the sort of very much the fad these days, and I think this is caused by having PhD dropouts running software companies is that uh, everyone believes in data-driven management, and Google runs on a principle of show us the data, show us the graphs. And there's this whole Google diaspora of people who believe in show us the graphs. So this means that if you have a PhD and are used to drawing graphs, you are really at a leg up <laughs> in convincing people internally. Other, th other th thoughts on the panel from your other perspectives, Doug? Well, I mean, so one of the things that Berkeley really embedded in me is, is a passion for doing good science and doing work that has an impact. And I think that's really important and I think that really has carried over in all of the jobs that I've had since leaving Berkeley and, and is especially important now that I have to keep impressing on Samsung, you know, my current employers, that we have to be able to do good science but science with a purpose. To me, uh, the, the most important thing I learned is that you need to build things out, and not just uh, you know write a paper or write a emulation simulation. You build things. Uh, like my work at Microsoft Research, every time when I do something, I always spend the time to make the things that actually work, have an artifact. Mm -hmm. I think that was uh, very important. So the kind of experimental approach at Berkeley type projects of actually building all the way through to prototypes is an important skill. Yep. Yeah. I, I guess one of the things that I, I want to mention, I want to thank uh, Randy for this as well. As you probably know, Randy was in the uh, in the CAD area you know, about 1980, and we are actually a minority. Like we just a bunch of guys mm -hmm. doing CAD related things. But I'm really into system. Um, but uh, at that time, sort of, I have to do this uh, CAD-related work. I'm sorry, but I have to do it <laughs> because uh, that's where the funding comes from. But I am doing it. It's not a, not a problem. But Randy actually gave me sort of a lot of latitude of um, gave me a lot of latitude of exploring different kind of interests. And I actually learned from that a very very important skill in retrospect. But that's really the most important thing that I think I pick up from Randy is the ability to 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 pick up problems and then to 
to position the problem in a certain way. First time I realized there's such a thing called positioning. That you know the same problem, you just have to like position in a certain way that interests people, that it can motivate sort of like the, the importance of the problem and to attract uh, people's attention, this and that. And then I, this is really the most important skill that I picked up. Like when I became an assistant professor, I, I sort of learned how to you know, pick up problem very easily because I had to have a lot of practice when I was uh, in a graduate school. So that, that to me, I think is a, the most important skill that I picked up in my graduate uh, education. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so Ari talked about some of the uh, immediate tactical stuff at Cloudera. So uh, let me offer a uh, slightly meta view. So at Cloudera, I was fortunate to observe um, our founders, uh, Mike Olson, uh, master of, um, do you have a master? Anyway, he's a Berkeley. Yeah. He's a Berkeley Stone person. He, he, <laughs> he parades the Berkeley flag high and proud and looks for every opportunity to troll everyone from across the bay. And then, of course, uh, Amr Awadala, uh, PhD Stanford, who looks for every opportunity to counter troll Mike. Um, <laughs> so, um, Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that makes it even better, yes. Uh, so anyway, so I think to an extent, um, the, the whole dropping out of uh, grad school to start a company, I'll try to address the, that, that kind of entrepreneurial train of thought. In a sense, um, no amount of education or schooling or learned knowledge can replace vision and drive, and in a sense, that's true in the entrepreneurial world. But in a, another sense, um, we heard a lot this morning about you know, finishing your degree uh, before you start a company and enter the in industry and so on and so forth. What that gives you, I think it's harder to come by, a little bit irreplaceable. One, um, it gives you a sense of history. So there's, we are all obligated in our dissertation to do literature search to understand what work has been done in the area in the past, and we get to see, um, even in this room, like the history of technology evolution from Linux, from TPC to Ray, to so on and so forth, to big data today. Um, that gives you, when you begin an entrepreneurial train of thought, a sense of perspective, whether the thing that you are talking about disruption is really a disruption in the sense of several decades, or is a thing that you talk about to impress a bunch of venture capitalists. That gives you a sense of that. Um, it gives you, in addition, a sense of, let's, let, let's call it a sense of community. Um, we are all here today, uh, in a sense we are all each other's academic family, like our academic brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles and nieces and nephews, and of course our academic father. <laughs> <laughs> so this morning, Randy made a joke that uh, there isn't much of a selection process. We just walk into his office and he goes, woohoo. Um, <laughs> there is still, I believe, some selection process because we first have to decide to walk into his office. And the sense of community here is really, um, regardless of how we began our collaboration with Randy after several years of working with Randy and being indoctrinated really by Randy, um, there's a sense of you speak with any member of our academic family, there's an immediate sense of, um, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. This person is semi-competent and semi-whatever. <laughs> yes, at least that. Not completely. <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, I think that, that sense of community and that sense of connection when you begin an entrepreneurial career, that is irreplaceable. Of course, you can get that elsewhere, but it takes a long time. And then third, I think it's, um, uh, it's, it's a little bit rare to get in industry, is if you do a dissertation well, I felt, um, then at the end of several years, then in some very, very narrow technical areas, you are expected to be the world's foremost thought leader in that whatever narrow technical area that you did your dissertation in. So the ethics and the professional expectations of how to behave in a secure, confident um, manner to champion your own work and champion the work of others 
you can get that without PhD, yes, but it will take time and whatnot. So doing a PhD is in a sense a fast track to get that very early in your career. And thereafter, you will just naturally know how to behave as a champion of your own work and other people's work. So I think you know, that's some of the things that's you know, different from what Ari talked about. Yeah. Jan Pai just illustrated the principle of answering the question you wish you had been asked. <laughs> <laughs> An essential skill that Randy passive aggressively taught. Because the, the question I was asking was more or less about, you know, like the graduate courses you took rather than the life lessons of graduate school. But let me turn it around a little bit as a, you know, sort of follow on question for the panel. Uh, Bill Joy, who several of us know, were you know, contemporaneous with him at Berkeley or encountered him afterwards. Uh, I think it's Fortune or Forbes magazine called him the, quote, Thomas Edison of the internet, unquote. Uh, big impact in terms of a lot of technology developments that eventually came out of Sun Microsystems. He was quoted as saying that he wished he could go back to school to study French literature or uh, you know, so, something not technological. He, he was sorry for the, the opportunity that he missed for studying certain non-technical things in his uh, graduate education and undergraduate education. So not necessarily going as far as a life change to the path of your study, but given what you know now, what do you wish you had taken then in terms of you know, an educational background that would serve you well for what you find yourself doing today? We'll, s we'll kind of make our way around the panel, so I'll start with Wei Dong. Uh, what, you wish you, you, what you know now that you wish you had taken, it could be a technical thing, it could be a non-technical thing. Uh, actually, I, I, yeah, I, I started as a double E student. And uh, I came here uh, uh, because I did some work on pattern recognition. And at that 2000, uh, I wanted to work on networking and then start moving to the soda hall from Kari Hall. Then I wish actually, if I knew I wanted to do computer science uh, after my PhD, or during my PhD, I would take a more computer science classes when I was undergrad. Okay, um, so I, I wish you, you would have asked me uh, the other question as well. So, but the, the second question is very much uh, related to the first. I think uh, I, I, I would like to say that, um, in, in fact, maybe maybe um, I would. The most important things I learned are not related to double E or computer science. Uh, it's like uh, what I learn how to deal with problems with uh, complexity, know my own limits. I think that. Uh, it's probably common to all PhDs everywhere. Um, in, uh, in Berkeley, I, I learned something uh, which I don't think people learn elsewhere, which is um, try to, to find what you really want to do, what will cause impact. And uh, you, you really don't, it doesn't matter if people don't find it important. If you find it important yourself, you just do it. Um, that, that I did not learn from Randy. Actually, I think uh, a lot of people were saying that, you know, in, in discussions and uh, lunches and so on. So uh, that's kind of a Berkeley thing, I believe, more, more in public universities than probably in private universities. Um, from, from Randy, I think I learned a lot on how to uh, motivate people, organize groups. Uh, I think I, I brought to my country this way of um, uh, forming a group of students and having uh, weekly meetings and motivating them, trying to, to understand what were their difficulties and trying to, I mean, to do it in a sensitive way, helping them to overcome them. And I have to say, to say that that is very much Randy because I, I remember other faculty uh, in, the, in the department that, I mean, some of them would not meet their students, some would meet them like once every two months and so on. But the way Randy organized and also the, the faculty who were also in the, doing systems at the time at Berkeley. They all had very much that kind of, of uh, organizing the work, which I believe it is very much uh, unique to Berkeley. There's not this e issue of the egos and so on. So there's really a, a community that is built up, and I think that's the most important thing I learned. All right. 
It would have been good to take a statistics course. Uh, <laughs> in my defense. This is the sort of answer I was yeah. sort of expecting. Yeah. <laughs> this exactly. answer comes with a story, which is that I, like, at one point enrolled in math 200 something or other, the graduate intro probability and statistics course. Is that 200 A? And they explained in the first day that you know you need measure theory for this course. Really, we mean it. Measure theory is required. It's not optional. It's not co-enrollable. You must know this. So I didn't go back for day number two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did. Exactly. I had this advantage, which is that. The Rad Lab was organized as a bunch of machine learning students and a bunch of systems students, and we were supposed to cross-pollinate. And some people really cross-pollinated. Uh, others of us at least learned some statistics by listening to the machine learning students talk mm -hmm. and would say, explain it to me. And so it was sort of an environment which one could pick up a fair bit of statistics without officially being enrolled in anything, which was nice. OK. Um. The kind of courses I wish I had taken, I'm not sure they are actually given in Berkeley. So <laughs> I'll explain why. So, so, so my current job actually is focusing on building sort of semi-product grade uh, software system with uh, the user state of the art the algorithm and techniques. Then I, ever since I started this job probably like six years ago, I started to notice the, the, you know, the very obvious uh, software quality gap between a uh, newly graduated uh, student and uh, a more experienced programmer. So, and that gap, I think, everybody is complaining about. It's not so much about whether students pick up the most recent, you know, a web application language. It's not about that. It's really about sort of like uh, the, the, the in school we don't. I'm, I'm guilty as charged as well because I used to be a professor as well. So we don't really teach students to write real world programs. And I can I can speak of two particular aspects of it. One is like we only we only tell students, or at least when we give student assignment, we only ask them to do sort of a normal case. Like the algorithm, the normal paths, they work. And then we give them some input, they work. And then we are happy. Like we never actually ask them to handle exception, error handling. And we all know that the normal case probably accounts for maybe one third of the code. The rest of the two thirds are about error handling, you know, exception handling, you know, things that, that you assume are there but are not actually there. That kind of sort of cases you have to handle. And the other thing is that we use terms like, uh, you know, reusability, modularity, extensibility, and some kind of adjectives to modify, to, to describe software architecture. But we don't really give students like actionable guidances that they can use uh, when they code. Like, yes, like reusability, modularity is a good thing, but how exactly do we do that? And we don't really give them that. We don't really stress that. So I wish that there's a course in Berkeley or in any campus that, that teach the like, writing program just like doing English composition, right? Like every piece submitted work, the professor would just write down common. You shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, and you should do it this way, this and that. You know, no, no, we, we, we learn how to do composition probably for 10 years, and then we can expect that our work actually published in journals or in magazine or in books. And, and without such a common and iterative practice, I don't really think that we can expect our students can produce code that can actually control a medical instrument or you know, run an electrical vehicle, right? So, so that kind of course, it, of course, it takes time. Like, you know, most professors are too busy. There's no way they are going to like, you know, like modify or give the uh, students each submitted work a really detailed comments of how to do this and do that. But then for English composition, we expect our English teachers to do exactly that. So, so maybe that's something that we should think about. Like how do we actually do something along this line and to improve our sort of like coding skill of, of our newly graduates, uh, graduate students. Interesting. Yeah, I'm cool with the French literature part. I didn't take <laughs> French literature, but uh, I took enough uh, stuff in the business school and law school to get an MBA minor, and Randy was actually very, very supportive of that, of uh, various random interests. So uh, I will actually like to emphasize Ari's point, statistics. Uh, I will em double emphasize it because I began a statistics class, then I dropped it. So this is a, um, a plea to all of the faculty sitting in the room could you please, 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 pretty please, use whatever influence you have to talk with the statistics department on your respective campuses. Get them to offer a statistics class 
that is practical, that has real life applications, that is not just solve a bunch of equations, but that tells me how to conduct a multi-factor experiment, how to uh, quantify empirical error, how to look at unpredictable data and figure out statistics significance of the data, that kind of practical thing, because I did not get that from the statistics de department here at Cal. And to I, be fair, it's a real skill now. <laughs> which is, you know, it's, it's statistics for experimental Mm -hmm. it's, it's inconsistent. I took a, uh, I must have, um, it's inconsistent between instructors. So I consider that. And the version I went into was not, uh, was not uh, to whatever standard. Doug? Well, so the obvious answer is, is I wish I had taken more of a business management courses, right? <laughs> I mean, the, but do you really wish that? Uh, no, I do, I do, I do. I, I actually have seriously considered at times going back and getting an MBA in addition to my PhD because I think it would be really useful, but I just don't have the time to do that. Right? Um, but the thing, the course that I really wish I had taken was was art courses. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Because I have no artistic ability whatsoever, and and you know, they makes those great PowerPoint slides. I know it makes it really <laughs> crappy to do PowerPoint slides, right? I do these really boring PowerPoint presentations, and if you're in business, PowerPoint is the lingua franca of, of business, right? That's how everybody communicates. Right? Um, and 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 also, you know, as a systems person, you know, I, I'm a plumber, right? We do underlying mm -hmm. stuff, but ultimately, you know, what makes technology that we develop useful is how it interfaces with users and how it affects them. And it would be nice, to, and, and part of that is aesthetics, and it'd be nice to better understand that. Mm -hmm. So I, I had definitely got the feedback uh, that it's important to open the floor for questions from the floor, so I want to do that. But I just want to synthesize a little bit of where we are in the discussion. So, you know, part of it is I heard about practical programming skill as something that, you know, given the realities of where people are likely to work, doing sort of academic problem solving type programs isn't enough of, a, you know, developing the skill. I heard about, you know, sort of like the reality of, of sort of business understanding, management, or effective communication uh, kinds of things as being important as part of that, um, you know, the, the sort of wisdom about choosing problems is maybe not something taught, but part of a culture of a research group or something like that. So, you know, there were several concrete ideas on, on sort of if I had to do it again, what would I really dive into, whether it's met statistical methodology all the way to better ways of visualizing and having visual impact in my presentations. So with that, let me open up to the floor for questions for the panel. Emery. Hi, my name is Amrit. I'm undergraduate student number 4,013. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I had a question. And Stanford PhD. I know. Do we? And, yeah, Stanford. So my question for is is the same thing. What have you learned at Berkeley that's helped you today, and what would you have done differently, Randy? Me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, the advisor is there. <laughs> That's true. Um, that is a very interesting. <laughs> I'm supposed to ask the questions around here. <laughs> yeah. No, well, you know, I think um, I'm less. Uh, you know, I don't. F I I I don't really feel like I ever really needed sort of an MBA. I think that. A lot of management skill is common sense combined with reading some books that you could buy in the airport <laughs> bookstore. <laughs> now, when I was department chair, for example, you know, I didn't have really a lot of management experience, uh, but I took some pointers actually from Gene Wong, who is here and had been department chair uh, several years before me of, you know, you, you want to have a mission statement, you want to have a clear statement of principles, you want to have three goals of things you want to achieve for the department. This idea of sort of communicate well and focus on a small number of things and execute on that. You know, I don't think I need, you need an MBA to sort of understand that sort of basic set of principles. And then you need kind of more of, okay, let me be sensitive to the world around me. What are the important things? What should those three important things be? 
to maintain the quality of our, of our programs. To At the time when I was department chair, was through that you know, gigantic uh, run-up of internet bubble where even our, our clerical staff were in high demand for startup companies, let alone trying to hire a programmer to work on campus when they would be much more highly compensated and so on off of campus. So one of my three things was to make the life of the staff better, which is actually kind of like revolutionary. Why would anyone care about the staff at Berkeley? You know, it's that, that's counter to you know, an element of a tradition about this place. So putting real effort into making the life of the staff better was, was uh, you know, kind of, uh, it, it was enlightened self-interest because we didn't want to keep lo losing good staff to startup companies into industrial demand. So, you know, there, there were things like that that, uh, so I, I'm not really answering your question because it's not the things I <laughs> wish I had studied because I don't know that they would have been there. I, I think maybe one thing that would have been valuable is a little bit more knowledge of psychology, um, which, I, you know, I think I have an innate knowledge of it. But I'm currently married to a psychologist, and it's amazing how effective she is at getting her way. Um, and so if, if I, and, and also, this is a person that, that I will never, ever, ever win an argument with, which it seems like a really valuable life skill <laughs> to be undefeatable in arguments. So, uh, maybe, maybe having a little bit more sort of formal background in psychology, which I think you could probably read about in books, if, if, <laughs> if, I, if I only, you know, <laughs> was motivated to do it. But that might be kind of a useful skill. <laughs> How to win friends and influence people. <laughs> more questions, more questions, yeah. Yes, Ilan. So I actually have a question, which is, actually the topic, I think, of this, <laughs> of this uh, panel. That's dangerous. Which, was, uh, which I'm actually curious about, and, and uh, across the board, and, and you also, Randy, I mean, what has the profile of graduate, edu uh, graduate students and graduate education as a result changed, just given the fact that obviously over the last 30 years or so, the opportunities for people coming in out of an undergrad have changed dramatically, the impact, what people want, I mean, what's... And what's that trend look like? Yeah, uh, so I can take a crack at that, but I do want the panelists from the perspective of either hiring people or working with them as interns in an industrial research lab to also have a chance, or you know, teaching them in Europe, have a chance to also answer. So uh, one thing is for a systems graduate student, the bar, you know, despite what Cheeker said, today, if you want, if you want to be considered amongst the elite graduating class of system students, you better have an open source project of your dissertation research that is being used outside of Berkeley. That, you know, this idea of publishing your software is huge in the current, pro now not everyone is gonna get to that level, but if you wanna be hired by MIT or Stanford, I think, you know, as a system student, you're gonna need to do that. Uh, that you, De develop something that has impact beyond Berkeley and has attracted other people to be interested in what you're doing. You could talk about that before. Now you have evidence. So you know the number of uh, contributors of software to your open source project might be a figure of merit for impact on the software you develop for your dissertation. So there is a, a there is a certain element of uh, a student. You know the the theoretical versus experimental. The theoretical students publishing a lot of papers, lots of papers, lots of papers in famous, uh, high quality, difficult to get into venues if they are on the track. But there also is this other way of getting there which is building software that many people want to use that also gives you certain competitive advantages in certain, you know, sort of uh, difficult to publish in venues because there's a cred factor that goes with it. So I would say people are kind of aware that there aren't this, this you know, they may come to graduate school with a desire become a faculty member, they quickly learn that there aren't as many opportunities as there are really smart people pursuing them in that particular direction, and they somehow get the sense of where they want to have their impact, and you know, are much more attuned to things like open source. Probably talk too long. Uh, other thoughts? 
I don't actually think it, for, for me personally, I don't think it's actually changed. And, you know, I've been around for a while. And if I think about what I look for when I hire someone, I look for people who clearly have problem solving skills, who can communicate their ideas, because if they can't communicate, then they're useless, uh, who can collaborate with others, and who have a passion for having impact. And I think that would have been the same thing 30 years ago, and it's the same thing today. Absolutely. Uh, All right. so, so maybe the more senior panel, maybe I'm wrong and the more senior panelists will correct me, but I have the impression that these days it is routine for successful systems graduate students to go off to product groups and that that didn't used to happen as much. But that if you look at where do successful people go, a lot of them just go to Google, they go to Facebook, they like go off and build stuff. That industrial development in product groups at this point is posing research hard problems, as they say, that things for which a PhD is a good preparation for solving them. And I have the impression that didn't used to be as true. My opinion, that, that, that also can turn into a threat because, you know, in my own experience that we, of course, we are, you know, getting just a sort of local PhD student from Taiwan, but when they come to my lab, then when they work on a problem, they are more practical, they have, and they, most important, they can access to data. Like my, my lab can have like all this connected car, and they can do tracing, this and that, the equipment are all there, cars are all there, and they can collect data just like that. And then they do think about it. If they are smart, they think about why would I want to go back to school if I want to work on this kind of thing. And, but but that, that, that's not saying that we should discourage students from continuing with their education. I'm just saying that there could be a threat. Like we also, when I was in Stony Brook, my students went to Google and then after a while they just like continue with their, they don't want to come back. Not so much for the money, but it's just, uh, just it's more exciting. So the, 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 the ability to build product and in the next two months that you come out and my grandmother can use it. That is very thrilling. And then that, that sense is just, it's very attractive to students who really want to, to do something, right? Not so much go to the academic career, just want to see their work somehow get uh, used by real people. And so I, I thought that's the, the, the sort of like a, they have this pros and cons for you know, doing the sort of more pr product oriented uh, things uh, in, when you are in a graduate school career. Yeah, when you think about, there's been discussion over the day of you know, the data-driven, how the field has become more data-driven. Where are you going to collect large amounts of data in graduate school? You know, if you really want to understand how your work is impacting a large community of users, you're probably going to do that in at least industrial research, if not also the development or, you know, this fuzzy boundary between research and development, which does exist in a lot of companies these days. So yes, actually speaking of that, I think a big change in the past uh, 10, 20 years is that the, there's a academia, you graduate, you go to be a faculty <coughs> member. There's you go to a company and uh, you become an engineer architect. Then the middle layer say, I'm doing industrial research. Started with Xerox Park, uh, later on we have Microsoft Research. But this middle ground is getting shrink and shrink. It's, uh, I mean, I mean we, we max out research still there, but may disappear in a few years. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just, uh, nobody knows, right? But the, now we don't have this middle ground. But the, on the academia side, it's a small. The, of course, I think a lot of people, particularly if they want to actual impact, they want to do a business, you go to startups, you go to big companies. I think that's a big change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no. we didn't even talk about the number of yeah. students who directly come out with their PhDs and go to startup companies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that particular perspective. How about a last question, because we're kind of coming up on time. And our answers will be very pithy. <laughs> <laughs> I can just speak up. Speak up. Yeah. So, uh, I think already what you said in response to the previous question, as well as what I heard from the panelists, was there's an expectation that what graduate students do today will have an immediate impact in terms of software that people use and how in fact they create software. So I see a downside to that, which is that academia has a luxury of looking long term and sort of thinking about old new things that may not see any impact during the lifetime of the graduate student. And this model might actually make people work on short term things which are not that different from what a startup or a, a company might do. So do you see that as a problem? So uh, did everyone hear the question? So it's kind of like this this sort of Raising the bar on impact and use of research products by people who are getting graduate degrees, uh, does this somehow bring in the horizon of the sort of perspective they might have on their work, uh, not thinking longer term? 
So I think the entire field, that sort of from innovative idea to impact, has shrunk <laughs> tremendously right now. And then part of it is because you know, Google has, has 30,000 programmers, of which, I don't know, 15,000 of them have a PhD in computer science, let's see. They have, you know, companies today have the ability to have a new idea and slip it under the covers without you even knowing about it to really impact kind of what you're doing to do amazing things. Like, my favorite example is Google, the visual Google Translate, where you point your phone camera at a sign in German and it translates it in the same font, in the same spatial layout as the sign into English. Where did they get that from? You know, it's sort of like someone shows you this while you're on a trip and it's like changes your life to have this wherever you're traveling in China or something like that. So, I mean, um, when you start thinking about what the limitations are in terms of language translation technology and all this other stuff underneath that, there's a lot more work in that area to go, but the capability is amazing even today, and that came out without an announcement overnight kind of thing. So this, I think even researchers, if they have a great idea, the test of that great idea is not, let's wait five years to see if it's, if it's gonna have a big impact. It is that it, you know, this path through open source and everything else, your great idea can have an immediate community impact in a very short period of time. Ari wrote a paper, uh, I pulled him in on DARPA uh, study, in the languages area, where you know, it seemed like every year the programming language flavor of the month was, was changing. And the thing that was amazing about it was how rapidly an ecosystem of tools, compilers, debuggers, visual, visual editors, you know, so Haskell gets interesting. You know, somebody starts developing in that. And before you know it, there are a thousand programmers developing tools in it. It's a, this ability to kind of shrink the development pipeline that allows you to get a good idea out to a large community is, you know, I think it's a challenge for everybody doing research right now. But it's also this tremendous opportunity of, if you have a good idea, it gets used very quickly. So the marketplace of ideas, it isn't the ones that get out there fast are necessarily the best ones, but good ideas can get out there fast. You know, the difference. Any, any other yeah. thoughts? So my very vague impression is that this phenomenon Randy is referring to where you must have running code. This is distinctive to systems and maybe even particularly to sort of the kind of big data-ish systems that we've been doing at Berkeley lately, right? And this happens to be an area where in some ways the barriers are rather low, right? That when I was doing my master's thesis, I was able to like borrow 800 nodes from Amazon and run an experiment. And when I say borrow, I mean someone else was paying. I don't know who that was exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right, but so you this could has also been a common theme of the day. <laughs> right, you, you could test stuff at scale pretty easily, and you can sort of put it up as open source, and then you get email from some guy at CBS who says, I installed your thing, and there's a bug. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, I didn't know you were using my thing, and now, now you're sending me bug reports. Right, that's sort of the bar for that is rather low. Uh, in a way, it didn't used to be when you had to like, put things on tapes and mail tapes. Right? So it, it's easy to do in some sense. And it's not that we're only looking at problems that are here now and we're not thinking five years ahead. It's that when you see a problem five years ahead, you can put the code out and people who themselves see this problem creeping up on them can start fiddling with it. So I think um, to follow up on the timeline, I think uh, one um, differentiator, as Randy pointed out, yes, everything, the time horizon to impact has shrunk for absolutely everything. But I think um, having the PhD perspective, if you like, is still a differentiation in choosing what you work on. Things that are revolutionary changes that may not turn a profit immediately, but will have a however many tens of billions market in several years, which is something that turns a profit very quickly, but is going to be capped at 10, 100 million. Um, so identifying that, yes, both of them will be realized very, very quickly, but I think the ability to identify revolution versus evolutionary changes and the potential impact on the technology field and on industries beyond technology, I think that skill set is something that uh, is not unique to PhD, but PhD will prepare you very well for. Yeah. I reserve the last comment of the session for Mark. So um, uh, the question was about uh, what sh uh, should uh, 
uh, top uh, students do? Well, first thing, these days, uh, as I understand from my students and also when hiring, uh, you need to publish um, you know, in a top level conference or journal. Uh, my understanding, but maybe students from Berkeley uh, get, uh, get the call to, to interview at uh, Google or uh, Facebook, but my students, if uh, they want to get an interview, they need to publish two or three papers, otherwise they will nev not even be called. So I think that's kind of the, the metric for being you know, on, the top, on the top rank. Uh, as for the being the top of the top, I think the, the, the most important thing is really to pick up a team for the thesis that we'll have in fact in four or five years. It's not, uh, I think, about the code because you, you could write lots of code, but th that doesn't mean that uh, you're going to be higher or be considered the top of the top students just because you, you put some code on GitHub that a thousand people download it. It's more about the opportunity um, that, that uh, code at that time opens up and uh, in order to have that you have to have thought about the problem at least two or three years earlier. That's it. Thank you very much.